Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. It would seem that Jesus is like the rest of us. Uh, he does not like to do the weeding. And uh, I never knew that I was so Christ-like. I've looked at my yard a lot of the time and I thought, let it wait until Judgment Day, because that's really the best thing to do. Now, with the master in the parable, it's not because he wants an overgrown field, and it's not like he's like some of the rest of us, that he just lacks the energy or the motivation to go and weed out the bad stuff. But we'll talk about that in a moment. Jesus tells us very plainly, the one who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, and the good seed is the sons of the kingdom. The, the weeds are the sons of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. So the explanation of the parable of the weeds is clear enough. And in our minds, and, and also in reality, the distinction between good and evil is also very clear. The Christian people of all people understand this. It seems that the rest of the world is trying to remove the natural law from the heart that tells us this, but we know that there's a difference, very clear difference between good and evil. It's a contrast that's as great as that between light and darkness. But the difference between good and evil becomes a little murky and sometimes a little less certain when you are surveying the field of the world and you find that good and evil are growing together often very intimately in the same soil. And as this parable shows us, their outward appearance is really not that different. So it's easy in the abstract to discern the difference between good and evil. The thing that becomes a little more difficult is when you look to yourself or to other people and you're trying to figure out just who is good and who is evil. Because everyone is either, ultimately, one or the other. You are either wheat or weed, you're either a son of God's kingdom or you're a son of the evil one. In terms, uh, well, in view of that, then the question in the parable that the servants put to the master makes perfect sense. They find out that the enemy has sowed the weeds among his wheat, and so they, they go to the master and they say, Master, do you want us to go and pull them up? Take out the weeds. Now, out of everyone, the master would have no trouble discerning between good and evil. You know that the Lord alone knows the hearts of all the children of man. St. Paul said in our epistle that he is the one who searches hearts. And yet the Lord tells his servants to refrain from pulling out the roundup. But why does he tell them not to do it? Because after all, he is under attack and he knows what's happened. The master has enemies. The enemy has come and he has sowed the weeds in the field. So if the master is not at least going to go out and give his enemy what for, then he should at least let his servants pull the weeds out of the earth. It's our sense of goodness and justice that tells us that evil needs to be uprooted and eradicated and destroyed. It's for the sake of the wheat, too, that the servants want to go and do this and make sure that the weeds are done away with. And the Lord does not disagree. The Lord, who is the master in the parable, is not lax on sin. If God had been lax on sin, then he would not have bothered to plant the crop in the first place. He wouldn't have cared whether he had a good harvest or not, but it's obvious that the reason he planted it was because he expected something to be produced from it. If God did not care about sin, then he would have just patted us on the head and excused us, and that could have been God's solution to our sin. Or what he could have done is he could have just blasted everybody, the whole field of the whole world, into oblivion. But you know what God has done, that he has given his only son to atone for our sins. So if he was going to be bothered to plant the seed at all, you know that he cares about good and evil. 
So his, in, his uh, servants are ready to go and yank up the enemy's seed to protect it. But then you hear what the master says. No, don't do the weeding just yet. Lest when gathering the weeds, you root up the wheat along with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time, I will tell the reapers, gather the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned. But gather the wheat into my barn. Now to think in terms of the parable, it is not easy for the servants to tell the wheat from the weed. Now the weeds that they're talking about here is not like crabgrass, that you could go out and see what's crabgrass and what's not. The Greek word for weed is zizania. And zizania is a particular kind of weed that for all appearances, it looks like wheat. It's really hard to tell, either in the grass stage or then when it grows up. It is very difficult to tell the difference between the wheat and the zizania. And so this is why the master cautions them. He does not let them go and do the weeding because he's afraid that they will pull up the actual wheat in the process because you can't exactly tell with the naked eye what is the difference. You cannot know until the harvest time who is weedy and who is wheaty. There's a lot more weedy things in Harrison. Have you noticed that? I'm sure you don't know anything about that. But uh, when Christ comes again to judge the living and the dead, when he sends out the reapers, then it's very clear in the final revelation who is wheat and who is weed. Now one assumes that the, the servants in the parable obey the master, but I think that you and I can feel their sense of reluctance. Because, yes, yes, okay, we can't peer into anybody's heart. Only the Lord knows the heart, but you and I both know. You can see some telltale signs in people sometimes that gives you some suspicion and it gives you some inclination as to whether you might be planted next to a son of the evil one. And we all do that all of the time. And in, Jesus himself does tell us, for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The other thing Jesus says about the heart is that it's out of the heart that come concrete things. Evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person. And in our day-to-day -day lives, these are usually the things that indicate to you whether you're actually dealing with the son of the kingdom or a son of the evil one. So on the one hand, we're supposed to accept that God's uprooting judgment is not something for us to worry about or to dole out. But sometimes I think if we were to be honest, we then look toward that harvest, that final judgment, with a little bit of anticipation when justice is served and the weeds are put to their proper use as fuel for the fire. The day will come. And the way that Jesus concludes the parable is he says that the Son of Man will send his angels and they will gather out of his kingdom all causes of offense and all lawbreakers and throw them into the fiery furnace. So try that in a small town. Try that in his kingdom and see what happens. And now we've come up against a very real dilemma. Because you obviously don't want to be a weed. And you know that good and evil is a matter of the heart. That's what Jesus says. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. But the last time that I checked, the words of St. James are also true. And his epistle, James tells us, for out of the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, this ought not to be. So yeah, the difference between good and evil is very clear. In the abstract. It's very easy to understand the difference. But you know what we want sometimes, I think, is we want the world to be like a Marvel movie. Where the difference between good and evil, you really know. You watch the Marvel movies. Who is bad? Who is good? Those differences are garish and cartoonish. It's very obvious. 
Some of the things y'all used to watch, it was the white hats versus the black hats, right? You knew who was good and you knew who was bad. That is how we would like life to be. We would like life to be that way so that we can summon the same sort of self-righteous zeal that the servants have when they want to go out and do the weeding for the master. You can sometimes feel moral and righteous indignation. And you can be like James and John, who uh, take it very personally when that village of the Samaritans rejects the gospel. And they say, Lord, do you want us to tell fire to come down from heaven and consume them? Only Elijah gets to do that, by the way, which you missed the fun, you know, if you weren't in Bible study this last week. Only Elijah, unfortunately, gets to call down fire from heaven on people who deserve it. But you and I know that things are not that simple, are they? Lately in church, we've been hearing from St. Paul in Romans chapter 7. St. Paul gives voice to the struggle uh, that all Christians face. St. Paul knew that he was a son of the kingdom, and yet he still knew the struggle that he had with evil in his own heart. And St. Paul told us, for we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh sold under sin. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. Paul gives voice to the struggle that every Christian has. Because every Christian is a son of the kingdom. His sins have been forgiven, and yet sin still clings to him. So the distinction between good and evil is very clear. What is not so clear is the separation between good and evil in you. So you do that sometime. Look within your own heart if you want a very frightening experience. That should keep us from being too gung-ho about wanting to get out the weed killer like the servants. The weed and the tares grow together intimately in the same soil, the same world, and in the same church until the end of all things. But you want to know where the line is, because when you do look to yourself, you can see, and I can see in myself, that there are parts of me, and you know that there are parts of you, that are a lot more zizania than wheat. That they are a lot more like tares than the wheat that God wants. And one thing is for sure, that stuff has got to go. But you know, swift justice and immediate straight line solution. If God actually acted that way, then he would take you out of the field prematurely. That is why the master spares the weeds. He, for the benefit of the wheat, he waits. He does not decide uh, that he needs to use one decisive airstrike because that would ruin the whole thing. The master never rushes. He has all the time that he needs to tend his field before harvest time. So when it comes to the weeds, when it comes to evil, you know what God does? He tolerates it. That is the proper understanding of the word tolerance, by the way. He tolerates it so that he can tend to the wheat that are the sons of his father's kingdom. We ourselves wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies, St. Paul told us today. So while the entire creation is on the verge of new birth, we groan and we hope and we wait and we also grow, even if the weeds are all growing around us. The master tells his servants not to fret, and he says the same thing to us as well. Fear not, nor be afraid. Have I not told you from of old and declared it? Do not be afraid, because the sower planted you, and he tends to you, and he will see to it 
that his harvest comes to pass. He will do the necessary pruning. And so all you have to do is leave his enemy and his enemy's sons to him. He will not let the weeds choke you. Just be the wheat. Just live in him. Be warmed by the sunshine of his grace. Be watered by his mercy. When it comes to the weedy parts of you that you're worried about, you repent and you receive your pardon and you receive the nourishment that you need before the harvest finally comes. It will be a great day when the crop is finally ready. When that day comes, we will find our way out of the field and into the barn. And everything that was partial and imperfect passes away. St. Paul says when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. Nothing is partial anymore when that day comes. You are no longer what you have been in your lived experience, which is kind of a mix between good and evil. There will not be any partial anymore. Death and life don't have to coexist together anymore. Joy and sorrow don't have to go together anymore. For right now, we see through a glass darkly. But when that day comes, then we see everything clearly. And what we see especially clearly is the face of our master and who he has actually made us to be by his grace. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. In the name of Jesus. Amen.